Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Um, I'm Leslie Farlow, a member of the Northampton Arts Council and also a member of the nominating committee for the Poet Laureate. Um, we were thrilled and delighted to name uh, Rich Michelson as Northampton's new Poet Laureate. And um, before we go further, I want to thank Bob Selman, who is the executive director of the Northampton Arts Council, and also Sandra Perrone, who couldn't be here tonight, but she's the arts administrator. And I also want to thank the members of the nominating committee, Joan Barberich, Alyssa Lovell, Alyssa D. Krause, Susan Kahn, um, uh, and Jim Neal. A very fine group of poetry lovers and poets. So you may knew or know our new Poet Laureate, Laureate as the owner and curator of the wonderful downtown gallery, R. Michelson Galleries. But you may not know that he is the author of more than 20 books. He's been a finalist for the Massachusetts Book Award and the National Jewish Book Award. He received a Sidney Taylor Gold and Silver Medal from the Association of Jewish Librarians, the only author to be honored with their two top awards in the organization's history. And over the past decade, the New York Times, Publishers Weekly, Amazon.com, and The New Yorker have all listed different Michelson titles among their 10 best books of the year. Michelson's poetry has been published in many anthologies, including the Norton Introduction to Poetry. Clemson University named Michelson their R.J. Calhoun Distinguished Reader in American Literature in 2008. And new poems have recently appeared in the Southern Review, Image, Art, Faith, Mystery, and the Harvard Review. His term will go from 2012 to 2014, and during that time, I know you will be seeing and hearing him and his poetry all over the Northampton area. And in fact, among the projects in the, uh, in the, that he has in the offing is a regular spot on Bill Newman's WHMP radio show during which he will be interviewing poets and reading poetry. Tonight, Rich has put together a lovely evening of poetry readings for us that includes the work of past poets laureate, as well as his own. And before I turn the podium over to him, I would like to quote Pulitzer Prize winning poet Richard Wilbur's description of Michelson's work. He says, it asks with urgent eloquence how the sweetness of life can be sheltered from the terrors of our time and what art can make of such a world as ours. His poems are artful, humane, and true. And now I give you Northampton's new poet laureate, Rich Michelson. <laughs> this, this is sweet. I thank everybody for coming. Uh, a couple of people have asked me, you know, how do you go about being Poet Laureate? Like, how do they choose you? Um, and I want to thank the people on the committee uh, who were just thanked by Leslie. I'd also like to thank Leslie, who, um, the, and the poets who are on the committee, uh, Alyssa Krause, Susan Kahn, Alyssa Lovell, Joan Bobridge, and Jim Neal, uh, none of whom I know. So the way to be Poet Laureate is not to know the committee, because I haven't pissed any of them off. Um, I figure otherwise uh, they would have gotten somebody else. So, um, like, like life, you know, we stand on the shoulders of those people who have come before us. A lot of my work has to do with generations and passing down knowledge. Uh, I thought it would be appropriate this evening, uh, since I'm standing on the shoulders of some of the prior poet laureates in Northampton to invite them here as well to uh, read a little bit to you. Um, it, first of all, Northampton has a poet laureate. How cool is that? <laughs> I mean, wow. I think that says right away something about our town and how we value the arts and literature. The uh, very first poet laureate of Northampton and uh, a good friend of mine is Martina Spada. Uh, what are the odds? Martine and I actually grew up a few blocks from each other in the same neighborhood in East New York. Uh, it was not the greatest neighborhood. You had a choice. You either learned to write or you learned to fight. And uh, Martine and I both chose the writing route of it. Uh, most people know or call Martine uh, the 
leading Latino poet of his generation. I'm going to amend that a little bit and leave out one word. Mr. Martinez Spada, it's a pleasure. One of the leading poets of his generation. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Good evening. Um, thank you, uh, Rich, and congratulations. Uh, this is a well-deserved honor and long overdue. Um, there are poets, of course, uh, who never get the recognition they deserve, and I am especially pleased to see Rich Michelson getting recognition for his work and I am proud tonight to stand here and call myself his friend. Uh, since this is an evening uh, dedicated to our new poet laureate in Northampton, <clears throat> to poets and poetry, I thought I would read uh, one poem uh, about the power of poetry. Um, and this is a poem from my book, The Republic of Poetry. Uh, in July of 2004, I was part of a delegation um, from the United States visiting Chile to uh, participate in the uh, celebration of the Pablo Neruda centenary. Pablo Neruda would have been 100 years old in July of 2004. Of course, he wasn't there to greet us personally. He had died uh, some years earlier, in September of 1973, immediately after the uh, military coup that uh, ousted uh, President Salvador Allende and brought the dictatorship of General Augusto Pinochet to power. Uh, but not before one final confrontation between Neruda and the military, uh, that is to say, between brutality and poetry. So um, I had the opportunity to visit his house uh, Isla Negra, where the following confrontation occurred. Um, and I was right there in his bedroom, looking out through the picture window described in the poem. The poem is called The Soldiers in the Garden, Isla Negra, Chile, September 1973. <coughs> After the coup, the soldiers appeared in Neruda's garden one night, raising lanterns to interrogate the trees, cursing at the rocks that tripped them. From the bedroom window, they could have been the conquistadores of drowned galleons back from the sea to finish plundering the coast. The poet was dying. Cancer flashed through his body and left him rolling in the bed to kill the flames. Still. When the lieutenant stormed upstairs, Neruda faced him and said, There is only one danger for you here. Poetry. <laughs> the lieutenant brought his helmet to his chest, apologized to Senor Neruda, and squeezed himself back down the stairs. The lanterns dissolved one by one from the trees. For 30 years, we have been searching for another incantation to make the soldiers vanish from the garden. Thank you. The fact that I also barely know our second poet laureate, Janet Owls, I think also says something about the vitality and the number of poets are practicing in this area. We can't even all get to know each other, but I think that's very cool. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing Janet's poem. Uh, I do want her to know that I went as far as a green belt, <laughs> <laughs> but never did I think once to recite poetry during my kata. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rich, for your generosity and in inviting us 
former poet laureate, poets laureate to be here with you this evening. It's wonderful, and congratulations. Um, I, I, I'm very happy for you, and I'm really, really happy for Northampton to have you. And I hope, I'm gonna do two short pieces. The first one I'll read a poem, and the second one I'll do a poem movement piece. And I hope that you receive everything that you want and more during your tenure. This first poem is called, Everything I Could Want. I steal time for what I want as if I could have it. As if the sunflowers that seeded themselves belong to our garden. Or the volunteer portulaca, more lush than those we planted. Ruffled blossoms blazing ruby cream and tangerine became this thick by my hand. No, I can't speak for them, can't explain their opening in different hues on the same stem, nor claim even one moment of their fire to exhale. Rather, walk a wide path and sing as if I could have everything I want without force. To touch each whisper of leaf breathing sweet earth green over and over beginning. To feel myself made of all the petals I've seen and those still sleeping. Luminescent asters in the blue hour of dusk. Mist rising from their starlight crowns and the moon almost full above the hills. And this next piece, I will step right over there. It's called Threads. And this is dedicated to freedom and the freedom that poetry brings us. Threads. I watched her open a spiral of hair. The way I remember dividing embroidery thread, one strand into many, each able to slip them through the eye of my needle, multiplying the number of stitches I could sew. Now I recognize that long ago motion in her hands, able to find in every breath, the listening uncoils a fiber, the weight of light between us, stars that guide, and blossoms to mark the crossroads, stitching freedoms. Hampton's third poet laureate is one of the great poets of our time, Jack Gilbert. Um, Jack is now in California and could not be here tonight. Uh, those of you who know me know that I am not much of a joiner. Uh, I don't join groups. But, um, but I am part of a Northampton poetry group that meets Monday uh, and has been meeting Monday for 20 some five years, thank you. Um, I'm always there early and on time, <laughs> and, uh, and I do actually manage to make it there sometimes. Uh, we've shared, uh, th this group has been a lifeline to me and to my poetry, and I, a number of my group members are here tonight, right over there, Margaret, Annie, Roz, and Henry, and all great poets of themselves. And Henry has recently edited Jack Gilbert's collected poems. I also do want to mention that, um, that we have a new anthology out, a group anthology called uh, Open Field. And that's on the table. Please take a look at that after the reading. And if you're interested to come through, you'll see all the members of our group over the years. Uh, we basically, the idea is to bring in fresh poems, new poems, and we will workshop them. I like to think that Jack cheated every week because his new poems 
tended to be more finished than my finished poems. Uh, Andrew, would you like to read one poem of Jack's? I'll read a short piece towards the end of this book. It's, uh, the last section is Uncollected Poems. I'm not sure. I, this, I believe this poem actually just, just appeared in APR, but I don't think it was ever published before. I know it was never published before, and I don't think it's ever been read before, probably not even by Jack himself. It's called Lust. I have drifted into the habit of going to matins. Today, I found they are repairing the church. The side windows have been taken out. I was shocked by the sound of swallows, by sun and the smell of morning. I realized there has been a mistake. I am going to do my best as Poet Laureate, but I am telling you right now, I am no Leslie Ann Newman. <laughs> so don't expect it. <laughs> Leslie and I have become dear friends over the years. Uh, it's been a pleasure. She's one of the other poets who has a foot both in the children's book world and in the adult poetry world. So she's absolutely great to get together and gossip about the business. And um, Leslie and I are reading together in October. I believe, do you know the date? Oh, I think it's the last Sunday. The last Sunday of October at Esalon in Hadley. This has been planned for a long time, uh, well before this appointment. So we are going to have a little mini Laureate Fest, Leslie. Well, what I will say to you is what someone once said to me, be yourself, everyone else is taken. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was really great. And I'm thrilled for you, I'm thrilled for Northampton, and like everyone else said, we know you're gonna do a great job. So, um, I have a precious five minutes, so I'm going to read just a few poems from, this is a new chapbook called I Remember Hachiko Speaks, and um, it's based on the true story of Hachiko, who was the famous dog who lived in Japan from 1923 to 1935, and waited at a train station 10 years hoping for his master's return. And so, uh, these poems are in his voice as an old dog looking back on his life. And because he's such a noble creature, they're all in uh, poetic forms. As a pup. Young and frail with my head on my tail, I traveled by rail as a pup. He walked through the gate, unlatched my crate, and I met my fate as a pup. He called me his own, gave me a bone, and took me straight home as a pup. Beneath the plum tree, while he drank his tea, I dozed at his knee as a pup. He kept me well fed and stroked my small head while I slept in his bed as a pup. Matching his stride as he looked down with pride, I pranced at his side as a pup. Then came the day that he went away, he told me to stay as a pup. He boarded his train while I stood in the rain, will I see him again as a pup? I wait by the track and sleep in a shack, they built me out back as a pup. Solid as wood, I sit where he stood, Hachi, his good little pup. That day, I ran to the train station faster, faster, deep in my bones I knew something was wrong. What had become of the one I call master? I ran to the train station faster, faster, rushing towards something that smelled like disaster, my heart beating wildly as I raced along. I ran to the train station faster, faster, deep in my bones I knew something was wrong. A loving friend. Do not forsake a loving friend, though it may be a lonely wait. Stay true until the very end. If he were able, he would send a message about being late. Do not forsake a loving friend. Don't ever let your loyalty bend. The faithful sit up tall and straight. Stay true until the very end. 
and may turn out you have to spend a decade sitting at this gate. Do not forsake a loving friend, and never feel you must defend devotion. It's a noble trait. Stay true until the very end. Your heart may break, but it will mend. Each day your hope does not deflate. Do not forsake a loving friend. Stay true until the very end. And this is the last poem. My master lives. My master lives as long as I lie here and wait under the sky. The trains arrive, the trains depart. They tear my very soul apart. I never got to say goodbye. But now is not the time to cry, and now is not the time to die. For while I hold him in my heart, my master lives. So now you know the reason why I rest here quiet as a sigh. You tell me that if I were smart, I'd leave and make a brand new start. I say be still and let me lie. My master lives. Thank you. So, the next 30 to 40 minutes is about me. <laughs> but then the rest of the two years that I am serving is really about you. So I'm really asking people, there are a lot of poets here and lovers of poetry in the audience, to email me, to friend me on Facebook. <laughs> so tell me what's going on with you in the arts. Uh, tell me about events that are happening so that we can then try to get the word out to the community. And uh, if we want poetry to be a more visual part of the culture, basically, we can do something about it. You know, whenever uh, my kids were young, whenever they used to complain about something, I always said, don't tell me, just go do something. Change it. So I'm telling you, you can actually tell me, but then go out and do it. Uh, because that's how things get done when you decide to do it. So I'm going to do some reading now. Whenever I read with Martin, I always feel I need to start out with a neighborhood poem. And most of my poems are set in Brooklyn. When I was young, the one dream I had was to work hard and get out. Today, most kids' dream is to work hard and buy back in but uh, it's a different neighborhood now. My dad had a small hardware store, and my job as a child was to bang up the new garbage cans before he sold them, because otherwise they would be stolen. Even as a child, I understood the irony, especially once there was a garbage strike and the garbage was piling up on the streets outside, and they couldn't get rid of it. But if you put a new garbage can out, it'd be gone in a moment. So that's when my dad had what I thought was one of his great all-time ideas. This poem is called Gift Wrapping the Garbage. <laughs> my father's gift wrapping the garbage. Beautiful, he says. Four bundles, and his accent, Brooklyn, wraps like a bow around each. Eight days into the strike, and the world smells like soup. Kreplach soup, he says. Your Aunt Ida's, know what I mean? <laughs> My son can't picture it. The neighborhood, its poverty, and I've lost the point trying to explain myself. Poor, I'm yelling, poor. And suddenly my eyes are popping like danger fields on Letterman until my son takes pity. Okay, he says, how poor. <laughs> Laugh, my father says, if you want to. But don't they all love Christmas? His accent was on the they. But weren't times different then? It was a Jewish neighborhood. And then it was a Negro neighborhood until the Puerto Ricans drove out the blacks. Schwartz's, I used to say, and Schwartz's would echo back. 
Stop talking garbage, my mother says. But aren't I my father's son? Every problem he taught me has a solution. And I've got to tell you, they stole their garbage. Lickety split. We dance together, clapping like two comics in a Catskills routine. Me squealing with my fidget dicker voice, high and squeaky, as I held on to him, held on to him tight. How tight, my son asks. But just now, I'm not in the mood for his sarcasm. I'd rather weep. I'd rather watch this old newsreel, my father working himself to death, I mean literally, and lying there maybe an hour on the street, one more dead Jew. Take out the damn garbage, I tell my son. Sure, I'd rather hug him. But right now, isn't my heart on the roller coaster at Coney Island? And I'm barely hanging on. That's the uh, first poem in the book. And this is the first reading, actually, where I'm not using the book because I can't see it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to read the last poem of the book, and then I'm going to read new poems. But actually, the last poem is pretty long, so it's kind of cheating. Uh, this poem has seven sections of about equal length. I tell that because I want you to know about where you are in the progress of the poem. I always tell this because it caught me off guard. I gave a reading once and I was reading a poem called Counting to Six Million. And I started, I said, Counting to Six Million, one. And everybody's eyes glazed over. <laughs> so, seven sections, equal length, recital. Blessed is the Lord who trains my hands for battle, my fingers for warfare. Psalm 144. One the original poem. My hands, French braiding my daughter's hair before her recital, are suddenly my grandmother's needing the ceremonial Friday night challah. The same dark veins, the Tigris, the Euphrates, spreading life into each tributary. Or palms turned up, eight trains arriving at the same station at the same time. Two others already empty and heading back out. Boxcars with pet names like the racing boats of the wealthy. Interior affairs, foreign policy. Or elbows held close to the body. 10 escape routes and two shtetls. My great-grandmother in one, my great-grandfather in the other. I'm holding them both in my hands. I'm like God in the old camp song. When my daughter starts to play, and I, forgetting myself, clap and keep clapping. And I think maybe this world is like God's boat, and he's named it genocide. And the next world is also his and ours to share. Two, foreign policy. Recital is the name of the poem I was reading at my first recital. My voice strung tight as young David's slingshot, his first war stretched between his sinewy hands. This is the battle he would sing about years later. But first, he had to learn to play the lyre, practice poetry and song, love and prayer. So much work just to celebrate his victory. Imagine him at the slaughterhouse, choosing the sheep, cutting its guts. His grandmother working quickly beside him, keeping the casing fresh to ensure the sensuous quality of the sound. She separates the fat, rinsing off the excrement and removing the membranes except for the muscle fiber. While David, his thick thumbs bleeding now, dries and braids the hanks. Music fit for a king. Three, genocide. 
Recital is the name of the poem I was reading at my first recital. When in the back, I heard somebody's grandmother shuffling down the hallway, her whole bridge game like Slavic barges in tow. And suddenly, chairs were scraping all over the place. Speak up, she says. What are you saying? I'm reading the numbers on her forearm. Each numeral a poem written by God. Perfect, meaningless, and containing all meaning just as you'd expect in a poem by the Poet Laureate of all universes, of all religions, of all time. Four, interior affairs. My wife's already in the kitchen baking cookies for our daughter's first recital when I sit down for breakfast. Somewhere it's nighttime. Bombs are falling and children are starving, but I'm pouring the milk and the sugar whistling a song and nibbling the nape of my lover's neck on my way back to the refrigerator. And neither of us can guess who will eventually find the cunning enemy cancer hiding like a secret code ring in the cereal box of the body. Five. All this I'm remembering was years ago. But years later, I'm rereading recital to my daughter who turned out to be a pianist after all, and is practicing for her own recital at the same North Shore Jewish nursing home. Her grandmother mired in the mud of the waiting list, and the whole family conspiring to maneuver her to the front of the line. She's the last soldier standing between me and my death. She's the pre-Columbus boat heading over the edge of the horizon, and I'm the nameless little boat following. Her husband died in the war of the streets, and her brother died in the war to end all wars, and her father died in the war before that. I want to die, not like Saul on the battlefield of my own sword, nor like Solomon, my house in disarray, but like David in his bed, reciting the Psalms, at war only with his own soul. Six lullabies. I'm standing in the back of the room, listening to my daughter's recital. Her fingers furiously pumping up and down, and now diminuendo towards the end, controlling the strings and valves of my heart. Maybe I am the sheep, sacrificing my inner life for the sake of her song. Or maybe her palms and fingers resting face down on the keys are only her palms and fingers resting. I'm alone in the back of the room, like a sentry guarding the free cookies, which, according to policy, cannot be eaten except in the recreation hall we call the afterlife. Otherwise, no one would sit still for the music. Half the audience is deaf and the rest already sailing home on the faint breath of the small boats they've christened battles and lullabies. I want to die, not like Goliath, a victim of modern warfare, nor like Uriah, turned love's collateral damage, but like David himself, a shepherd leading his flock to feed among the flowers. Seven. Would you still love me, my daughter asks, if I had played all the wrong notes? She's wondering what it means to be her, Jewish, American, and upper middle class in a time of war, when all she really wants to think about is poetry and song. Would you still love me, my wife asks, if I were old, ugly, too thin, toothless. She's bombing her own body weakly, shrapnel embedded in the roof and walls of the holy house where we prayed and made love. Would you still love me, God? David asked his God, if I killed a man for no better reason than to take his beautiful wife as my lover? 
would you still love me? I asked my father. If instead of fighting my own battles, I deserted, conscientiously objected, sat on the sidelines, writing without even once harnessing the power to revise my life like words on a page. Would you still love me? God asked my grandmother in the reception hall before his grand recital. If I wiped out your entire family, let's say all at once, leaving one self-involved American tributary to tell the tale. Life, my grandmother once explained to me, is not poetry, never was, and was never meant to be. Now, by way of answer, I watch her wipe away the faint smudge of chocolate still fresh on God's lips. Your grandmother's one tough cookie, he whispers to me, while she rustles about, her chair scraping every which way. What, she asks, speak up, or no one will hear a word you are saying. As for your certain and coming death, she adds, I don't know if you're a religious man but you might try praying. So I mostly write for kids. <laughs> um, and uh, people who know my adult work say to me, you write for kids? <laughs> like, you write about death and destruction and all that kind of stuff. And the answer is yeah, pretty much. So I'm going to take a break and read you a couple of kids' poems. Uh, this is from my book called Animals Anonymous. And Mother's Day is coming up. So I'm going to read a couple of poems in there about mothers. And that book, by the way, is all spoken in the voice of different animals. This is the mole. The poem is called, Holy Moly. <laughs> Mama fed me earthworms when I was a baby mole. She chopped them, sliced them, diced them, and sometimes she served them whole. But first she said, excuse yourself, give praise, and don't be rude. We're all of us pursuers, and we're all of us pursued. Some days we get to eat, and other days we are the food. I studied hard at school, and I met my mole goals. I furrowed to my burrow, and I dug my mole holes. I grew up happy, healthy, and I got to smell the roses. But Mama served up truth each night, right beneath our noses. No one lives forever. Every body decomposes. So when the earthworms dine on me, dear God, please rest my soul. I don't pretend to understand your ways. I'm just a mole. Anything you tell me to, I'll do without a question. But maybe you won't mind a theological suggestion? Everybody dies, but how about I be the exception? <laughs> I wasn't the easiest kid to bring up. I thought I was cool. And I thought I was tough. And I like to get in trouble. So, Mom, if you're watching this, when I send you the tape, this is for you. I love you. This is called Lamb on the Lamb. My mama called me cuddly kins. That's where me problems all begins. I see how tender sweet lambs worried they'd end up stewed, kebabbed, or curried. So's I chomped on fat cigars and hung with jackals, hijacked cars. Why trail some dumbass girl to school? Ain't no mama's lamb, I cool. But now my white and snowy fleece is being chased by the police. They catch the tenders and the toughs. So here's my plea to you, young roughs. 
Don't be like me. My life's a muddle. I should have given me Ma a cuddle. <laughs> I'm also not always the best husband. <laughs> if you go on vacation with me, like my wife likes to look around and see things, and I like to read about the things, <laughs> but I never look up to see them. So, you know, it's like, um, you know, we were biking through Death Valley of all places, you know, and I'm sitting there reading my guidebook as I'm writing and going right past the scenery. <laughs> Let's see what else you need to know about this poem. Um, Spock refers to Spock. <laughs> Death Valley. Wildflowers as far as the eye can see. And then we're cycling again past the artist's palette and over toward Badwater, the lowest point, my Baedeker explains, in North America. Can't you ever just enjoy, my wife, exasperated and dismissing again the tour book, asks. But who, at Dante's view, doesn't imagine Virgil as their guide, disguised maybe as this two-wheeled pack mule, overburdened with bedrolls and canteens, laps and sin. Spock, we're going in, Kirk says, knowing his ass will be well covered. And that's exactly how I feel, coasting now, enjoying the simple ease of descent. Tonight, we'll camp in the canyon, 282 feet below sea level, under an endless expanse of stars. But right now, I'm hot and dry, just one more middle-aged, middle-income Jewish American on vacation, in dire need, as my father would say, of a good schwitz. <laughs> We're still debating, though he's long dead, good versus evil, global warming, and intelligent design. No, I shall, then yes, with a young child's uncertainty. Repentance is what I've taught my own children. So what they've learned is recycling, upward mobility, and God help them, compassion for the poor. If the world were 100 people, my high holiday prayer book tells me, 80 are living in substandard housing and 60 are suffering from malnutrition. But I'm still worshiping the future, yesterday's science fiction. And tonight, I see in each bright star a virtue. From telescope peak, even the breathtaking panorama of my greatest sins appears pitiful. Let this tarantula pursue its female at dusk. Let them wander 40 years in the desert. Let them crawl out from under our blanket before dawn. Let me finally, at Furnace Creek, escape the hot sun of my father's city. It's not about enjoyment, I say, undressing. But heavens above us, my white-robed Beatrice answers, blessing us both and guiding me in. Dante mood. Dante's politics. It's really odd, you know, when you travel um, and, you know, you can go to the Middle East or Eastern Europe and go in some old synagogues and the floors are made up of swastikas. You know, we tend to forget this is, you know, the Nazis did not make this up. It's an ancient symbol for life, good luck, etc. But still, it's kind of odd. It made me start thinking about how things are remembered in the future. Um, you know, how we communicate and what we can count on, etc. Dante's politics. 
The decorative mosaic adorning the ancient synagogue floor is innocent of its future. Good luck, it means to say, or my swastika hands miming perpetual motion wish you everlasting peace and prosperity. And what coincidence sends my son running across the plaza, blowing again and again on his precious pinwheel toy? Say what you mean, I want to shout. I am listening to the politicians in the courtyard, excavating for small truths buried beneath thick stratum of tedious lies. And when I am dust, who will interpret these few love poems addressed to family and friends? When I am gone, who will explain Dante's politics to my child? Exiled during the war of the blacks and the whites, did his writings favor empire or church? Sometimes I forget even my own lust for small temporary power. Good luck is my wish for my son, who briefly holds his breath as if contemplating his future and the pinwheel of words he will spin into the world to disguise or uncover his meanings. Couple more. I have one Northampton poem. And then I'll go back to Brooklyn. But I have to read this because he's looking over my shoulder. So I'm sneaking this in. This is called The Business of America. If the cost of the poem composed in the book lined study, is equal to one half the hypotenuse of the poem memorized in the jail cell of the mind, what is the value of silence, my son asks, mocking me as another evening dawns in this story downtown of Northampton, Massachusetts, where from my window I can see the glass door that opened into the office of silent Cal Coolidge, whose memorable pre Six memorable pre-depression words, the business of America is business, still quoted in the cultural literacy lexicon of the world, has a hundred million more hits than Frost's famous five, good fences make good neighbors. Poetry is found everywhere in my neighborhood where the business of poetry is poetry. I'm not thinking of Emily's silence is infinity, three words first whispered by that white devil Calvinist god named punctuation. Oh, American poetry. What soul wouldn't I sell to purchase a timeshare in the condominium of your college syllabi, the neighbor's yawps notwithstanding? It's so noisy in there, I can't hear the quiet of my country's cash register not ringing. Not even in this bargain basement of bad ideas. This prison where the poetry of America is business. I'm going to skip a couple. I'll read you two more. My poetry group and I went to Russia together to meet with Russian poets. It was great fun. This poem is called Dead Negro. Nothing is where I left it. The empty littered lot next to my father's hardware store has turned up two blocks to the north. Even the store itself which sold its last hammer and nail to the contractor who tore it down, putting this substandard duplex in its place, 
is missing. And the neighbor's children are now the neighbors. And the chalk outline of my father is rained from the gutter where he settled down with the bullet that killed him. Somewhere else, the murderer is murdering somebody else. But everything is the same in the poem where the poet misplaces his keys. My old Jewish neighborhood is filled with blacks, and the African-American neighborhoods are busy with Asians, and the Mexicans are everywhere. But here, in this dark bistro in the Soviet era city of Skov, six hours south of St. Petersburg, there is a dead Negro on the bar menu. The dead Jews, my father among them, rise up in protest like the benevolent protectors they once were. They are looking for the picket line, which is no longer where they left it. And the leftists have moved to the right, and God is looking for God everywhere. Nothing is where I left it. Not my hammer and sickle, not my star of David, not my well-thumbed book of poems. My wife and my children are nowhere to be found. Oh, Amachai, can you help me to find my keys in the pockets of the Palestinian boy moved into my Brooklyn home? His sister is missing, and his mother is not where he left her. It's enough to start anyone drinking. I'll have a dead Negro, somebody says from the next booth. A black man, maybe the one that killed my father. But in this light, I can't tell. Everyone's looking exactly the same. I just realized I passed over all my art poems. So I'll have to do this again. <laughs> I'm writing out about art. Most of my poems are about art. I don't know. I'm going to uh, end with an old poem called Undressing and Freedom. Undressing and Freedom. I think of how undressing me, she would tilt back her head as if listening for footsteps, the faint marching of the SS men whose one great dream was her death. They must have feared how her young Jewish fingers unbuttoned and buttoned, as if they had continents to cross, as if here in East New York I was already tiring and no one at home to put me to bed. Undressing Aunt Frida, I try to imagine her healthy, undressing herself, slowly at first, as if for the love of a man, untying her green checkered apron with the secret pockets, unwrapping the frail, just shy of five foot body, whose scarred beauty Rubens would surely have missed, but Rembrandt, in the loneliness of his dying days, might have immortalized. My daughter at my side grows restless. She unties her shoes, tugs at each sock. She has learned recently to undress herself, and pausing occasionally for applause, does so now. <laughs> Naked, she shimmies up onto the bed and curls her thin fingers around Frida, who, as if she wished herself already dead, doesn't coo or even smile. A dream of love, Frida preached, is not love, but a dream. And bad luck, I'd say, follows the bitter heart. But undressing her now, I remember the lightness of her hands and their strength, which somehow lifted me above the nightmares she had known. I'll care for you, she whispered once, as if you were my own. My daughter yawns. I lift her gently, hoping she'll sleep the hour drive home. And I wish you all a good drive home. Thank you.
thank the Forbes Library for opening the library tonight for us. And they have also offered us some refreshments. So as you sign and are signed, you may, um, where is it? It's in, across the hallway. Um, there's some fruit and beverage. Thank you very much for coming, everyone.